Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by a great group of guys, the most we've ever had on the podcast at one time, to talk about Simmons drums. So first off, just hey to everyone. Thank you guys for being here. Hey, hey. Hello. Hello. Thank, you. Thank you for asking me. Yes, absolutely. Now we will... We will go ahead and introduce everyone. Um, so real quick, why don't we start with Mr. Darren Pfeiffer, who's been a huge help to this podcast and this uh, setting this up and getting all these guys together. And then I think the best thing to do is maybe have everyone introduce themselves to get the most correct info. So Darren, why don't you start it off? Tell us about yourself and then your connection to um, Simmons uh, kind of in a, a brief manner. So go ahead and take it away. Cool. Well, to start, I'm a huge fan of the Drum History Podcast. Uh, it's wonderful. Every time I have a question or something, I, you know, I hit one of the podcasts and there's always, you know, 10 times more of an answer there than I was expecting. Um, so I wanted to get uh, a Simmons presence on the Drum History podcast. And in my world, it was such a huge influence of uh, music through the 80s and 90s and even today. Um, there's Simmons fans. The equipment is still in use. Uh, the equipment is collected like crazy. It's all having a moment on eBay and Reverb. You know, prices are sky high. It's wonderful, wonderful equipment. It's a pleasure to play, a uh, pleasure to restore and collect all that kind of stuff. Um, I wanted to get some um, some experts, some Simmons experts together. Some of you have worked uh, at Simmons um, and some of you are responsible for keeping all of the Simmons equipment that's around today alive and well and still on the stage and studio. So that was kind of my goal here. And um, outside of that, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here meeting all of you uh, on the video here. And I'll be taking notes because <laughs> this is a real <laughs> treat for me, just uh, information and history. And I love it all. So um, my personal background, I'm a drummer. I'm a huge Simmons fan. Um, recorded a lot, played a lot. You know, same old story on a studio. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, Steve Watts. Uh, if you kind of give us an uh, introduction and... Uh, tell us about you and your Simmons history bit. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm now working down in uh, Devon, uh, which is on the, the south coast of the UK. Um, I started at Simmons. Uh, I'm sure Pat will correct me if I'm wrong here because I'm terrible with dates. But it was about 1983. Um, and I started off uh, working uh, under Pat and, um, most memorable thing about starting there was uh, making my first ever cup of coffee and um, Pat telling me off for how appalling it was and uh, making me go and doing it all again because uh, it was so bad. Um, that stuck with me. It's frightening, isn't it? 40 something years, and that's that, that's what I remember. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I started at, uh, at the old mill. Uh, and I started in the drum department where we were assembling the uh, SGS-5 pads. Um, and then when we moved to uh, Auburn Park, um, which was more uh, kind of getting into the SGS-7 era, um, I moved from the drum department into uh, initially running the stores. Uh, and then from there, I took the the grand title of International Customer Services Manager, um, which basically meant uh, uh, just kind of dealing with all of the, uh, the, the studios and the artists and, and the support uh, and acting as a kind of liaison between uh, all of those guys and the, and the technical side uh, at Simmons. Uh, and that's me. Nice. Incredible. Well, why don't we jump? Because so, Pat, you worked at the same time then back, you know, your original employee, as we heard, and you're pretty tough on coffee, as we've uh, learned as well. So what's your background and story with that? Right, I started work at Simmons in 1982. I was the 10th person to be employed by him. Uh, when I started working there, uh, there was three directors, there was three managers, and there was four employees. I was a fourth employee. I was the second person to work at the drum department. It was me and a drum department manager. So uh, it was like that, um, you know, wow. for a few months, maybe three or four months. And then we had a fella called Dave um, start working with us, David H. And then we had a fella called Jim. Uh, yeah, Jim, a fella called Tim. And then I believe Steve Watts come along. And uh, he was terrible at making coffee, like he's already admitted to. 
And, uh, <laughs> you know, we all just sort of saw the company grow. It started off very small in a um, kind of a, a run-down mill. And uh, originally, Sims Electronics had two floors of one of the buildings. And then the drum department expanded. And we took over another building, like a third building. And uh, I think, you know, when I started there, I started in 1982, I was the 10th person. By 1985, we was in um, Hatfield Road, um, and there was 150 employees. So that's how the company grew, and it grew rapidly. And uh, obviously, as everyone knows, it was a world leader. And it was a real pleasure to work there, real pleasure you know, to work for them. Awesome. Thank you, Pat. And then, uh, Ed, real quick, why don't you tell us about you and your involvement with uh, Simmons, which goes come, we'll come back more in detail later, but tell us about yourself, Ed. Well, hi, my name is Ed Rose. I run a business called The Simmons Guy uh, out of Lawrence, Kansas, and I buy, uh, sell, and repair vintage Simmons drums. Very cool. Yes. So we will obviously be talking about that later with more of the what's going on with Simmons stuff today and who's using them. But um, Steve Graham... Why don't you tell us about yourself? Yeah, basically, I started off as a uh, collector of drum machines and old uh, electronic drums and various things from the 80s, and then started writing about drum machines initially. And then I moved on to electro electronic drums. And yeah, the Simmons book basically came about just, um, I'd already compiled all the information on the actual British uh, drum history of the 80s. There were quite a few companies, but um, the Simmons one, I was a particular fan of just mainly because of the music, uh, the groups at the time. I was a teenager in the early 80s. And um, it just developed from there, um, just by getting in contact with various people from the factory, including um, obviously Steve there. And the, the book just grew from there to get more of a story behind the actual book, and basically update the book that had been written um, back in about 1985, just to try and um, put a conclusion onto the company, really. Yeah. Which is great because a lot of these histories don't get like archived the way they should, as you did in your book. So it's it's great that you did that. And we're kind of doing a little bit of a mini version of that right now, which uh, we will plug the book more as we go. But um, all right, guys, before we jump into the actual company history, let me say very quickly, I want to give a big thank you to Mr. Adam Parsons. Uh, Adam is a great guy and has a great YouTube channel. Uh, called Adam's Drum Room. He joined up at the upper tier in Patreon, which really helps support the show. So, uh, and he's just a very well connected guy and has an incredible collection that I recommend all the guys on this uh, interview right now check out because it's mind blowing. And Adam is like connected in some very cool stuff. So, thank you to Adam Parsons for joining Patreon. If anyone else wants to, patreon.com slash drum history podcast, and you can learn more there. So, uh, thanks to Adam Parsons. All right, guys, Steve Watts, Pat. I don't know whoever wants to start first here, but like, let's just go to the very beginning and really learn about the beginnings of Simmons drums. I know you guys were, Pat, maybe you start off because you were an earlier employee, but really go to the origin of, of Simmons drums. Okay, right, you know, so uh, by the time I'd come along, you know, they would start producing the SDS-5. I don't really much about, I don't really mu know much about the company, you know, prior to that. But um, So I've turned up and... Uh, you know, there was two people in the drum department, and I think we were trying to produce about 100 kits a week. And uh, these plastic shells, polycarbonate shells, came in, and we had to spray them. You know, we sprayed them, you know, by hand. And, uh, you know, we assembled, you know, assembled them, off, <laughs> assembled them as well. So there was two of us, you know, doing that. And, you know, the, com you know, the sales... Uh, you know, for the company, right, was getting larger and larger. So ultimately, we had to employ more and more people in, uh, you know, drum department. And uh, so that's what happened, you know. As time went on, you know, we employed, uh, you know, more people. It was a very friendly company, you know, to get, you know, very, very friendly company. Um, you know, I started there, right, I had, I had a really severe speech impediment, but I felt comfortable, you know, going into work on a daily basis. I felt valued there. They was all kind, all considerate, you know, people. You know, they never hurried me. You know, they explained thing to me, things to me, you know, really concisely. And it was a really nice place, you know, to work. And uh, in in the early days, I think there might have been um, 
Now, there were certainly backdoor repairs. I don't know if there was any backdoor sales. I can't say if there was or wasn't. But you'd be working away and a drummer would walk in. And maybe not a, you know, maybe not a drummer that was immediately uh, you know, recognisable. But over the course of the years, you know, that I did work there, I did end up, um, you know, not coming across a few of them. And, uh, yeah, that was it. I met a few roadies. A couple of them, you know, stand out. Um, I get, I got asked some particular, uh, like, interesting things. I had to go and buy, I had to go and, I got handed uh, a tambourine, a purple tambourine, and it come from Prince, and it went from Prince, you know, to Dave Simmons. And then Dave Simmons brought it into work, handed it to me. I had to go and find an identical match to that paint. Like the producer, I had to paint a kit, you know, for prints. And uh, there's a few stories like that. And uh, it was just a really interesting company. You could go and make yourself a coffee anytime you don't want it. There was no, you know, there was no real strictness. As long as everyone came in and done their work, everybody was kept happy. And that's what it was yeah. like, you know. And, uh, you know, I used to enjoy going to work. I never wanted to take a day off. It was a real pleasure, you know, to go out and work. It really was a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, and it, I just, right, I grew up at that company, right? I passed my test when I worked at that company. I got my first girlfriend at that company. I bought my first flat at that company. So I kind of grew up with them, you know, for a few yeah. years anyway. How old were you when you started there? I started at 22. I started at 22, yeah. I can't remember how yeah. long I worked there for. Um, sometimes I think I worked there for five years, but I think it was long as that. I think it was longer than that. It might have been six or seven years. I can't really remember the date, uh, you know, that I left. I remember the date started, but I can't remember the date I left. And, uh, yeah, it expanded rapidly. And uh, with expansions, you know, more people come in and the drum department grew. Um, as did the other departments, you know, there was a production department, a test department, you know, so the production people, they were making the brains. Right? Um, when I started there, there was production employed two people. <laughs> test employed one person, a fellow called Roger, and a manager, Alan. My drum department employed me and a manager called Mike. And uh, production, there was two employees and a manager called Peter, great directors. Lovely, lovely yeah. company. Real pleasure to work for them. Uh, the money was piss poor to begin with, <laughs> but it did improve. <laughs> As time went on, it did improve. I must say that, you know. Um, yeah. I, I think in the early days, you know, they could have been struggling and, I wasn't really sure. Nobody was really that sure about the product. Uh, I think Jeff had to go in his car and go around knocking doors, selling it. Um, and then it got chart success. That's, the, that's, you know, that's what happened. It got British chart success. And it just flew. Absolutely yeah. flew. Took off and flew, yeah. This episode is brought to you by Pocket Percussion in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philly. Pocket Percussion is thrilled to announce that they now have lesson and rehearsal space right there in the shop. And on October 14th, mark your calendars for a creative percussion workshop with the one and only Billy Martin. That's October 14th with Billy Martin at Pocket Percussion. Pocket Percussion sells used gear, stands, cymbals, custom drums, snares, hand percussion, vintage gear, plus hard to find parts and everyday necessities. In addition to buying, selling, and taking trades, he also does great repairs and reheading. Visit pocket-percussion.com to learn more about drum lessons and get all the details for the October 14th event with Billy Martin. And keep up with their newest gear on Instagram and Facebook at Pocket Percussion. Well, it became completely iconic and it's a symbol of an era, which makes me wonder, Steve Watts, let's jump over to you. First off, Tell me how old you were when you worked there. And then the question at hand really is, what was it like to work at a company that was like changing pop culture, basically? You know, I mean, the face of drumming, but in general, people see that design and they know exactly what it is. I mean, yeah. how old were you, though? Absolutely. Um, I was a about 21 uh, okay. when I started there. And in fact, uh, 
uh, yeah, Pat's right. I'd, I'd forgotten this, um, that uh, Jim Pinnock uh, worked in the drum department and then he got promoted up, I think. Did he do graphics or something, Pat? Was it? I, I don't think it did was he... graphics. I think, I, think was what he? It, I think he was saying to do a product design or product product management. So he had, was to, it? Keep, yeah. he, he had to manage uh, all the different things, you know, that kind of went into production. I believe yeah. something along those lines. And then yeah. Dave, Dave got promoted. Um, he took over packaging, didn't he? Yes. Did you yeah, take over? Yeah. yeah, packaging. That's what happened. Yeah. There's a packing department. So all these other departments, you know, were being created because you know the more drums were produced, the more packing that occurred, and we had to employ people just to just to pack. There were so many. Yeah. There. Yeah. That's real deal yeah. business yeah. stuff. When I started there, like they gave me a time limit of 15 minutes to produce a bass drum. <laughs> 15 minutes per <laughs> drum. And I was really Jeez. slow. I was really slow. I ended up producing 12 an hour, which was really quick. Such an enjoyable yeah. job. It's quite an easy task. And uh, we just, I just used to listen to music and get lost in it all. And it was good. It was flying. Everything yeah. was flying. Lovely place to work. Yeah. Anyway. Definitely. So, Steve... Tell me about, did you realize when you were working there the impact of what you were doing and the importance of it in, in culture, or was it just kind of like you're just doing your job? When I first got there, um, I, I mean, I, I didn't know anything about the company. The only reason that I I even knew of it was because uh, Jim got this promotion. His dad worked with my dad, uh, and I was I was looking for, you know, just any old job at the time. Um and my dad said, oh, this, oh, you'll like this, because I, I had been a drummer. Uh, and my dad said, oh, yeah, you know, there's this this company, they're making drums. Uh, he didn't even say that they were electronic. Uh, he just knew it was a drum company. Um, and so uh, uh, I went down there. Uh, Mike, who ran the drum department, the interview basically consisted of, can you use an electric drill? Uh I said, yeah, I'd never picked up an electric drill in my life, but, you know, <laughs> there you go. Um, and so so I, I got into that, um, and I even then I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have any idea of, of how big this company was in the, in the, in the music scene. And then um, it, was, it was quite bizarre. We would, I wrote, again, just these things, odd things you remember, in my first couple of weeks, we were just talking about what music we liked, um, and I, and I said, uh, "Oh, you know, I'm a, a, a big fan of Howard Jones, uh, who, who just had his, I think then he just had his first single, um, so new song had just just recently been in the charts, and uh, I'll never forget Dave Halford uh, uh, turning around to me and saying, "Oh yeah, he was in here last week." And you know, and that's when the you know the light bulb kind of goes on that um, yeah you know that you're you're actually you know into something quite special. And then I I, I have to just uh, I have to say something Pat didn't mention, but it it always cracked me up about the company. And he's right, it was really friendly. Uh, Friday evenings, we'd all go over to the Fighting Cox, which was the the old the old pub just next to the old mill, and that would include Dave. Uh, you know, so it was a nice sort of real family atmosphere but the thing i remember um because i was terrified of everything i had to do there i hadn't really had a job um uh like that before i got to the to the factory and so started off in the pad assembly and then one day i was asked to go and collect the the drum shells from the the, the spray room the, the the paint shop and the paint shop was right at the top of this other building which is what three floors up pat three or four yes. floors up something like that because it was the attic wasn't it and the way you got there was to to walk up an external fire escape up up these four stories just into the door and you had all these so you, you can obviously all you guys would know and i'm sure you know the, the viewers will know what a what an sgs5 pad looks like so that polycarbonate shell on the back uh would have recently been sprayed and you can imagine kind of how slippery they are as well and they were stacked about kind of 10 or so high just just alternating the pattern as as they went up and you had to balance these 
and carry them out of the out of the spray room and down four stories of fire escape and wow. it's it's one of these things you wouldn't get away with it now with pack i can see he knows what's coming you wouldn't get away with it now with the health and safety but all of the um all of the the thinners or whatever it is in the in the paint all of those fumes would be coming up because you were holding these things quite low because it was quite windy <laughs> <laughs> and and you just have a face full of this stuff and by the time i always used to say by the time you got to the bottom of the fire escape you were higher than you were when you started you know what I mean? it was, it was, a, it was a, but it was but it was all kind of like that you know it, yeah. it was just not yeah kind of casual but at the same time you know you, you had to do the job but it but it wasn't all about you know all strict rules and management and all that kind of thing it was really very friendly um and i guess kind of just returning to your initial question apart from that uh that thing uh, i mentioned before uh about howard jones coming to visit i think it was really when we got to uh when we moved the factory from from old mill to alban park and that's that's you know and especially in the job i landed up doing that's when you really knew Mm. Uh, that that this this was massive, yeah. Cool, yeah. You guys are lucky. It's definitely a uh, interesting. I mean, it's a for to be such young guys working in such a, a cool place. You probably don't appreciate it at the moment, but now it's 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 it is history. Speaking of history, let's jump over to Steve Graham, uh, author of the Complete Simmons Drum Guide: The Rise and Fall of Simmons Electronic Drums, and just kind of rewind a little bit. We've heard from two of the uh, two of the kind of original employees. Uh, Steve, fill in a little bit more about the origins of the company and how we got to these guys being there carrying drums down fire escapes and all this, uh, you know, awesome stuff. What? How did it all start? So, yeah, going back to the um, the beginning, I guess, um, to start with Dave Simmons himself. Um, obviously, drum synthesizers have been around since about 1974, um, albeit they weren't very good. Um, I mean, just looking around this cupboard that I'm in at the moment, I've actually got that I'm just surrounded by um, what I would call, or my wife would call old junk. Um, there's a syndrome here and there's various other things that I've got here, but um, they weren't very good and they only made a certain type of sound. So Dave, um, he was working basically for a company that um, with a supplier distributor for ARP synthesizers. So he repaired all those and he kept getting asked to do modifications um, he was also in a band, so he played uh, keyboards in a band, um, which, which again, actually came close. Well, one of the bands came close to actually having hits uh, later on when his, when his company really got going. So he was coming up with these little inventions, and he came up with the, the first sort of drum synthesizers uh, working for a company called Musicade, um, which a few people bought, the, um, a band called Landscape. Um, they had a, a drummer called Richard Burgess. He was actually, um, he was from New Zealand. Well, he's, he's British, but he was from New Zealand in a couple of sort of hippie bands. Uh, he went back to the UK and um, joined this band Landscape. So he picked up a couple of these early uh, drum synthesizers that David bought and various other people bought these early units. Um, Musicade was struggling. So it was, a, um, it was an importer of um, various, various, um, <laughs> things that nobody else seemed to want, like um, Asbo Drums, which was a French company and various other um, things that no one else would stock really. So they, their, um, their actual things that they were, they were trying to sell weren't very good. But in the background, Dave was working in a little um, workshop behind the shop, which was basically a, a small residential terraced house. Uh, that was their shop front, uh, just had a big window at the time. And he was coming up with these little drum synthesizer inventions and came up with the SDS-5 really, which was the sort of breakthrough um, instrument. Again, working funnily enough with Richard James Burgess, um, who put a lot of input into how they should sound and also what, uh, in time, what the actual shape of the pads were uh, to make them hexagonal, uh, like a sort of honeycomb. So you could actually have them all joined together as a, as a pad, as a, like a set of pads to make it easier to play. Music A basically went bust. Um, and from that, Dave basically decided to set up on his own, um, which again is literally when they went, they started moving to Abbey Mill, um, just down the road in St. Albans, only a couple of miles away from the old um, premises in Hatfield Road, the old uh, residential property. 
and I think that's pretty much where where um, people like Pat would have come in. Um, Dave Halford as well, who um, I've been in contact with, he also worked there um, for a time, and I guess it grew with it. It grew from there really to. Um, I think they said they wanted to sell. If they could sell ten kits in a month or something. The company would be successful, and they and basically they started off selling way more than that. Um, it took a long time for America to to get involved, really. But um, certainly, around about 1980-81, um, these drums basically started appearing on play, programs like Top of the Pops, which is a big uh, it's a music chart show run down on the on the main channel, BBC One. Uh, that's where I first saw them. I was just a, I was a kid of about thirteen or something, and um, it was my kind of music, I guess, at the time as well. Uh, all these sort of drums, electronic drums appearing. Uh, Dave Stewart, um, Barbara Gaskin had a number one hit, I think, with um, with a cover version of the track. And oh, what does he got? He's a keyboard player, Dave Stewart. But he's playing drums as well as having his drummer who played a Simmons kit. There's a bit in the song where Dave Stewart starts doing drum rolls on a Simmons. So what better advert for the company, really, than to have these right on on show in front of 10, 15 million people. Um, yeah. That's how many would tune in that time. Wow. And they're so visual. And there's the, the color to it, which f earlier electronic drums were cool and sounded good, but they seem to uh, really harness the power of like the visual. Ed, why don't we throw it over to you? We're now kind of, they're getting seen on top of the pops. People are seeing them. They're getting very popular. What happens from there, maybe through, you can jump on some key points, but through to the, the you know, end of the heyday? Well, I think, yeah, in America, the heyday really probably started closer to 83, just because it took that amount of time to get from the UK to the United States, just because, you know, there wasn't an internet. So, you know, all this information took so long to, to travel across. But, you know, by 83, I mean, like, every song that was released in the United States of America had Simmons drums on it. I mean, it's just like if you look through the charts of, you know, popular music charts, whether it's, you know, you know, uh, R&B, metal, all that, everything had Simmons drums from like 83 through 85. Um, so, yeah. And just real quick, you know, there are very few instruments that get made that not only have an iconic sound, but an iconic look. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, Simmons really got right with the SDS-5 was... Uh, not only did it sound killer, but it looked killer. And no one had ever, ever seen anything like that before. And I know for me personally, like, I started hearing uh, Simmons stuff coming over from the UK. And I was like, God, what making that, what's making that sound? And every week I'd go into my drum lesson and ask my drum teacher, it's like, you know, what is this? And he's like, maybe the star stuff we sell upstairs. But, you know, no one really knew. And then one day I come into my lesson and he's got tiny little picture um, from like Modern Drummer or Musician Magazine of an SDS-5. And he's like, that's what makes that sound. And when I saw that, I nearly died. I was like, are you kidding me? That sound comes from that. That's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. So anyway, yeah, there was that that heyday where, you know, 83 through 85 in the United States, you know, just Simmons stuff was everywhere. You couldn't escape it. Um, and then, you know, things changed. I mean, trends don't last forever. And as that kind of started to die off, not only, you know, the sound was becoming a little dated just because it was just so overused, but um, visually it became kind of a thing. It's like, oh, that's for like, you know, this kind of band that uses those pads and stuff. And, you know, by the time rock and roll came back around to the United States, which was like 87 ish when, you know, Guns N' Roses and, um, uh, you know, all the, the, rock, the L.A. rock bands of that era came out and, yeah yeah i mean that basically spelled the uh, end of the year for simmons so you know i think from then you yeah. know sds7 was never the hit the sds5 was sdx was never really a player um just because there was no you know they took too long to get out and then you know by that time the whole thing was done and you know unfortunately that was it yeah it happens. It had a it had a good run. Uh, it was pretty incredible. But it, there there seems to be resurgence of things. Which now, uh, let's hop over to Mr. Darren Pfeiffer and hear more about what what happened kind of after that. And then because I mean they're still very popular. 
I mean, you guys and 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 you guys repair them and restore them and collect them and and love them, Darren. Talk about it from there about what's happened with it and and kind of you know. So it 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 never really fully went away, but what what happened after that? It never really fully went away, but I feel there was a time in the '90s where a lot of this stuff was just junked. Um, it sat around in you know storage units and warehouses and garages and everything like that. And uh, there was a. Um, and there was an episode or there was an interview with Moby and he was showing his, his studio and it's just filled just floor to ceiling with, you know, these immaculate vintage scents, like anything and everything you could possibly think of is like, you know, in his in his home. And uh, yeah. he said, you know, there was a time about like 92, 93, pretty much after the grunge explosion where everyone wanted real drums, everyone wanted real guitars, you know, everything was back to just the raw music. Um, and a lot of the electronics just got thrown away, thrown away, put away, pawn shopped, thrift stored, you know, whatever. And all the new stuff was just sitting on shelves and eventually got, you know, clearanced out of, uh, you know, music stores and everything. Um, so uh, he, he said, specifically like, oh, this 808 here, you know, I, I paid like $200 for it. And, you know, like 93, 94, this, you know, this Juno over here, you know, I, I got that for like 50 bucks at a garage sale or something, you know. So there was a time. Uh, where it, it wasn't, you know, it was just kind of put away and forgotten about. You know, the the trend had moved on, the you know the style had moved on, and um, just say you know what throwing this out there. Last ten years or so, there has been a resurgence. Um, the eighty sound is popular again, but people are rediscovering what amazing instruments these were. Not electronic instruments, not, you know, not fake drums, but actual instruments. If you really got into them, you can, you know, create something beautiful and just as expressive as, you know, an acoustic instrument. Um, so recently there's been um, uh, collectors, you know, we, we try to find this stuff. Uh, some people get it out of there. They still, you know, they still own it. So they, you know, they go in their garage and go treasure hunting and dig through and and they get this stuff back out and you know most of it doesn't work you know batteries have leaked everything's corroded inside you know there's rat poop in it whatever um and so uh just in my experience everything that i've found is pretty much gone to ed <laughs> it's fixed it fixed it all up he still has a whole stash <laughs> of my stuff that i need to like you know text you about a little later but um there's a big push to get all this stuff back out get get life into this stuff again. Um, SDS fives, sevens, even the, the eights and the nines, the, the smaller, uh, you know, more portable. Uh, in, there's an SDX on reverb right now that's, you know, $5,500 with no pads. And, uh, you know, you have to have the pads that go with that one. Um, wow. Yeah, but there's a push to restore all this kind of stuff, bring it back to life, use it in the studio and stage. I, I recently sold uh, an SDS five to a friend of mine who said, hey, um, I'm in a band and they're going through their old 80s catalog and we're doing, you know, remasters and everything like that. And uh, we want that sound that was on their live and everything that was recorded back then was on an SDS-5. So no, no samples will do, you know, no emulators will do. I need the actual box. I need the actual sound. And I've had a couple of things come my way from clients who, you know, I have a song and I want this sound. Um, just last week, a friend of mine, uh, called and wanted the bass drum sound, Alex Van Halen's bass drum sound. And he was at, you know, what what settings was that? And I actually found a picture of one of the SDS fives that he had, and it was a, a snare drum and all toms. <laughs> so you know, maybe <laughs> maybe instead of a bass drum, he had it was a tom that was really tuned low. I have no idea. Yeah. So yeah, still looking into that. Wow. But you know, even today, some of the biggest tours that are out, Harry Styles, uh, Sarah Jones is a drummer for Harry Styles. She uses two. Uh, of the um, the Simmons pads to her left on the kit. I don't know what she's using for a brain for those, but that just goes back to the visual impact having these things on stage. Uh, another one is Ricky Lewis with uh, the Weekend. He's he's got uh, what six seven Simmons pads on his kit, and they're they're front and center, right next to the toms, right next to the cymbals. It's part of the drum set. It's part of the show. Um, Jeff hmm. Friedel, uh, Ray Mayorga, like these guys use this this equipment out there today and it's it's fixed up and it's modern and it's uh right up there with you know all the latest and greatest um uh other electronic drum options but one wow. of the things about simmons uh, and dave's vision that i really love was it was so drummer forward uh it wasn't necessarily and you guys can 
you know, kind of correct me on this if I'm uh, uh, a little off target. But he was so drummer forward. Uh, the drums weren't necessarily marketed strictly for producers and studio owners. They were for drummers. And the visual aspect, there needs to be a drummer on stage. There needs to be a drum set on stage. And to my understanding, the, the pads could have been any shape. Uh, there was like a, a heart shaped pad, a, uh, the hexagonal ones. And like, um, there was another shape or two that was, uh, uh, at a trade the, show. The, the, dev, the, the, the devil kit is the, is the, is the, um, is the most famed one, isn't it? Yeah, where who, is that? Can, can you remember who that was for? <laughs> Landscape used those on uh, Top of the Pops. Here. I think that was the first first time. I mean, ultimately, the 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 hexagonal shape won out. Uh, it was m you know more popular, and then you know plus just the shape of it, you can put it together like a drum set. You can put the toms close together. Uh, you know, you can put a, sure. a couple of pads. Uh, Bill Bruford had you know famously that giant rack system behind him with you know look like a hundred Simmons pads uh, up on a Simmons wall, and it was all. You know, it's it's so yeah. much a part of the show, and you know, it, even now, if I go to a concert and you know see a band, I you know the drums and the equipment and the production, it's all part of the show, and yeah, you know, I'm sorry, it's got to it's got to look cool, it's got to match. But, yeah, it does. Yeah, but that stuff is is being used today on huge tours, and the stuff that's out there, I can guarantee you, probably pass through Ed's shop. <laughs> at one point or another. At one point or another, yeah. I don't think very many of those drum kits you know were made. You know the head kits. There was only a couple of them made. I think they was like experimental. Or somebody might have asked for something, um, you know, totally different. Uh, I, I don't think there was any real idea of putting them in a, a production on on a large scale. They were more one-offs. Yeah, that's what yeah. I remember about those. I'm just I'm just reading it actually. I've, I've, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is terrible, isn't it? I've had to Google it myself. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Wolfgang over in Germany that runs the Simmons Museum, um, he would have been fantastic to have on here as well. And he's he's got a page uh, on those kits, and they were sculpted by a guy called Coleman mm. Saunders, uh, who was a friend of Dave's, uh, and um, uh, Steve Graham was uh, absolutely right. Um, it was landscape with Einstein a go go that featured that kit. Mm. Wow, pretty wild. But the hexagonal one out, obviously, as we uh, that seems more practical and more easy to produce as well and less intricate. Um, yeah, can I ask uh, Pat and Steve one more question about kind of the history related stuff, and then we can we can talk more about the modern like with Ed. I want to talk more about what's going on with you know how it works with updating these and what goes into that. But real quick, Pat and Steve, were you guys there towards the kind of end of the, you know, the, when, when things were becoming, it was less popular. Were you there at the shop at that time or had you already moved on to another job? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I bailed. <laughs> <laughs> I get no, to be, to be fair. Um, I, I, I can't remember uh, what year that must've been kind of 87 or something. I think, um, but I uh, basically, I Dave was doing some work with MIDI, um, and I had a Yamaha DX7, um, and Dave asked, just literally asked to borrow it because then we could do some kind of interesting things. And we had uh, Baz Watts was our our demonstrator at the time, um, along with uh, Sibby from from Germany, um, and they wanted to put on a thing up at the up at the British Music Fair and so Dave sent me up there uh, with the uh, with the kits and the DX7 and everything um, and then basically like cut a long story short while I was there I got poached by Yamaha so um, uh, uh, the, it was it was for very stupid reasons and ones I regret greatly that I that I jumped ship uh, and went to work for Yamaha um, so I didn't really see that that phase but pat i know definitely uh you stayed on didn't you and mm. saw much more of what that. was that like pat well I, I didn't stay on sort of you know to the very end um i believe I'm, i stayed on to either 87 or 18, 88 and i saw i you know i saw a bit of a decline in a you know the company and uh yeah they were left basically yeah i mean it's a job yeah 
All right. And then real quick, before we get to more of the modern stuff with Ed, um, Steve Graham, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened with it closing? But then if I'm not mistaken on the Simmons website, it looks like 2006, it got re the brand got relaunched through Guitar Center. Is that correct? Yeah. So basically, um, my understanding, they had pretty good success up until really the STS-9, I think. And then there were kits made after that, like the STS-1000, which again was just more of a brain in a, in a one unit rack, which was obviously easier. The pads, the pads had obviously improved greatly since these ones here that I've got. This was like the STS-8 sort of pads, <laughs> a well-used pad. <laughs> and it's literally three pieces. This is it. Wow. Um, so again, they came up with the, um, the STS-9 pads were an improvement. The thousands, those pads were like a generation three or four. And then of course, they, the ultimate one was the SDX um, kit, which is like this amazing um, brain that could sample and everything. But unfortunately, like, like um, Ed had mentioned, it just took too long to come out. Um, by which time all these people started coming up with samplers, just normal rack samplers. Um, they used the technology from the SDX, although only what, 100 and so kits were sold. Um, the technology was used for some of the other kits, again, onto the Trixers, um, which is quite a good device. I think I've got about three of them somewhere. Um, I must have the biggest collection of Trixers, I think, in the world or something. Um, various other um, instruments. And the last I heard was people were literally, the company went bust. So going from a, a turnover of several million a year, it dwindled to virtually nothing, around about 87 with the SDX. And um, I just heard that people said the factory was shut. And the last thing people were doing when they were leaving the factory was literally taking like the service manuals of the um, the things because they thought, who's going to service these, right? We don't know what's happening with the company. So they just bailed. Um, and that was um, over at Auburn Park, the big factory they had. So Dave basically, his uh, company got bought out. He developed another company and just set up in smaller premises, um, just, a, you know, 10 or 20 miles up the road and carried on for a couple more years. And then gradually the the sales and the repairs and everything for these um, devices just like dwindled to nothing. He ended up setting up um, a silicon device for um, nails for making um, you know, for people to do manicures and things. And he made he's made his money from that um, wow. for many many years. <laughs> didn't didn't expect that. <laughs> That's a but, change. Yeah, yeah, a complete change. And again, yeah. by the time by the time he finished, I think the only person working for him was Mike Sears, who was one of the managers that um, the Pat and Steve will obviously remember. Mm. Um, I think he was his last employee, along with Daphne, who was the um, basically secretary, and she also I think she was like the personnel manager. Dave, Steve, and uh, Patrick will correct me and things like that. Nah, so she was she was company secretary. Yeah, they were the last employees, and then of course, years many years later, um, someone one of his. Uh, friends like an old musician friend rings up Dave and says what's that new kit you bought out and uh, he says well I don't know anything about it <laughs> and um, it was just basically and this has been going on for what the last decade I think you've seen with other companies as well that people have said hey this name is up for sale the logos the trademark has elapsed so people have started using his trademark um, reactivating the Simmons brand uh, from Guitar Center which was a company again that with, had quite a good relationship with um, Simmons back in the 80s and they just started coming up with quite cheap Chinese made um, electronic kits and just put in the Simmons logo and brand onto it wow um, so he wasn't associated with that it just sort of like nothing to do with it he they just started using the name yeah so basically what had happened is the rights had elapsed and again you, you'll see this with um, I've done well, sort of I guess with with other books, things like Lin Electronics and so on, you'll see that the rights basically um, they after so many years they elapse just like the patents do in time. Like Bob Moog's patent for his synthesizer, is, there's only a limited time for the patent, and then hey, anyone can make a mini Moog if they want to because the patents elapse. And this is kind mm. of a thing that's been going on. So Guitar Center obviously came in and they said, hey, we can just put this cheap kit out. We'll call it a Simmons. Um, so. I mean, without I'm not I'm not a lawyer, but um, he obviously went to court over it and um, got some pretty famous people on his side, as well as uh, former people from his company, like Baz Watts, for example. I think appeared 
on Dave's behalf as a witness and things like that. And they just, um, in Britain, certainly, they managed to get the rights restored that they couldn't actually use it. And I'm not sure, I'm um, entirely sure what happened in America with that one. But um, they were quite fortunate that someone actually came along who worked for this new company that was, that was bringing out these kits and said, well, would you like to work with us? And that's basically what resulted in some of the later kits that were quality kits. Um, he did actually have input into it and said, Look, if you're going to use my name, at least bring something out that's good. Sure. Because he didn't want his, he didn't want his, um, you know, the history of the Simmons tarnished really by these very cheaply made um, Chinese kits. Yeah, I mean that was my understanding as well. They after uh, after many years of manufacturing these, you know, uh, they're they're beginner kits. Um, they brought him in as a consultant, starting on the SD two thousand, I believe. And uh, it, that kit is quite a departure from uh, the earlier Guitar Center Simmons kits, just because you know the, the the hexagons are back. You know, it looks it looks like Dave had a hand in designing that one. But there's such a disconnect between the Simmons now and and the Simmons of old. And on social media, uh, the Facebook groups. Um, there are, you know, new Simmons that, uh, you know, people post pictures of their brand new Guitar Center Simmons kit, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm just discovering Simmons for the first time, you know, these kids are buying these kits. And then they discover the rich name of the history that goes back forever. And then, you know, has all these, you know, these wonderful dimensions to it. So um, if you're, however you discover Simmons or how, you know, whatever generation you're in is discovering that rich history of Simmons, if it's, you know, just through uh, social media or if it's through buying a new Simmons kit and discovering it, you know, backwards, then, you know, then that's all great. But yeah, Guitar Center has yeah. been uh, uh, making those kits for uh, for a while. I want to say, you know, maybe 10, 12 years or so. It happened similar to the Orange County drums kind of story, how they took over and it's just yeah. a part of it. Is it good or bad? Whatever. That's up for people to decide yeah, on their own, it but is, it's yeah. sort of a, the name would go away without it. And then it brought Dave Simmons back in and it's, it is what it is. But, um, Ed, I want to jump over to you and talk about like, let's hear more about like about what you do with these. So if someone finds one at a garage sale or something, or they're a huge touring drummer and they want to get it fixed up, how does that process work with you? And what, what's the whole, what's the deal with it? Well, yeah, I mean, with repairs, it's like, you know, I've got a repair schedule that books about six months out. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you find something at a garage sale and you're like, hey, Ed, can you fix this? It's like, yeah, I mean, yes and no, because um, because of how busy I am right now, I've had to kind of be a little selective about what pieces I take on. <laughs> so I don't take on sure. any of the budget stuff anymore. I'm just purely, you know, the, the top level stuff from here on out, just because there's just not enough hours in the day for me to support the, you know, the SDS nines of the world. Well, it's good to be busy. I mean, that's pretty cool that there's now like a sub category beyond the company going, you know, it, it's still in business, but let's just consider we're talking about the classic Simmons basically, but that you can you can, there's now an ecosystem where you can survive and pay your bills by fixing these things. Uh are, is your background in like a working, you know, electrical engineering kind of stuff that it made sense for you to do this? Well, no, I mean, the first half of my life, I was a record producer. So uh, it wasn't until uh, 2018 oh. that I started doing Simmons Guy, uh, supposed to be part-time, but now it's full-time. Um, and I've been working towards it for, you know, better the better part of a decade. It's just I never had the time to really fully pursue it. So, um, now, no, what started off as like, like this is going to be a fun little part-time job has now turned into, you know, more than a full-time job. That's awesome. Well, it's fun though. Uh, it's pretty cool. So, congratulations on doing well, it though. You. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you've built yourself a job, you know. Yeah, there, yeah. there's a lot of this uh, stuff still out there, and it's all broken. All of it. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I, I guess I, the guys who made it originally didn't make it well enough, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was it was made fine. It just wasn't cared for after the fact. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. like I said, Ed has a, a, a whole stash of you know my stuff that's piled up somewhere in his workshop, and. Uh, uh, you know, he does great work. And if you, you know, need anything fixed, I think Lynn drums and, and uh, star instruments and, you know, anything that's no, <laughs> he no, no, no. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not doing anything other than like the upper end Simmons stuff now. I just got, uh, right you on, know, right. there's only so many hours in the day. 
there's plenty of it it's it's like it, the stuff is rare but it, you know it's not that rare there's you know it, it, you can find it uh, on you know the the used markets or craigslist and facebook marketplaces and stuff like that but you know pretty much 99 percent of the time there's something wrong with it <laughs> that uh you know yeah. that needs to be taken care of i mean look it, the older stuff you know the sds5 it's you know it's analog gear um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, smash it on the top of the casing and it works fine after that, I, you know, but, uh, you know, for the, yeah. for the hefty stuff, we got to send it to the, to the professionals. So, you know, just a personal thank you to Ed, uh, the Simmons guy for, uh, you know, for taking care of uh, the, the stash of gear I have here. And then, you know, uh, also more to come. That's great. <laughs> You're very yeah, welcome. that's awesome. Sorry, sorry to like cut across. I just got an interesting thing. I don't know if you just, just want to cover it. Sure. Um, just it just because the 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 subject of clones and copies was mentioned um yeah. i'm lucky enough to have this famous this oh, famous yes. yeah mm. can you describe it for people who are like listening and not watching oh, like sure. in the, they're listening in the car yeah okay so basically it's a regular um sgs5 pad i don't know if pat actually made this he might well have done possibly the shell has basically been um made to emulate uh, a japanese flag because uh, we were very proud as a company to be uh, exporting electronics to the Japanese, which obviously mm. in the 80s was uh, was was quite a thing. But something just when we were talking about the copy kits. Oh, hang on. Uh, uh, so, there we go. There it <laughs> there's, is. There's a photo there's of the it. Ads. There's the oh, We've got, hey, got multiple it. photos <laughs> coming up on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Super cool. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, you know, we were talking about uh, people sort of copying the kits and so on. And one of the things that always made me laugh was was back in my time uh, at, at Simmons, and this would have happened at Auburn Park, that I know uh, that uh, Dave and, and, and Daff and the other directors um, had to uh, fight a case against a company, probably uh, Japanese, can't, can't guarantee yeah. that, who were knocking out some cheap... Uh, Simmons copies and one of the things about that made me laugh and I don't know if this is going to come up okay on the camera but you can see in the rim uh, here that there's a, there's a little gap uh, just there uh, Pat will will bear me out on this the gap isn't supposed to be there so Steve I think I know what you're talking about right I think I think I know what you're talking about right it's not the actual rim right if you just look above where the where the lead plugs into, there's a little dent in it. There's a little dent in the shell. And what happened? The bloke who made the mould for the shells dropped it. Or he dropped something on it and he had to repair the mould. So the Japanese company that copied the drum even copied the repair. That's, that's what it. That's what, yeah. oh, that's, wow. what I was, that's what I was getting to. <laughs> that's that's what exactly, yeah, there you go. And also yeah. what I believe, I, I do know the Japanese company, you know, you're talking about. And I think, you know, what happened um, somewhere along the line, Chinese and Japanese companies started mass producing really cheap electronic drum kits. So Dave, in response to that, brought out some cheap kits so that he could compete with the cheaper end of the market. Mm. I don't think it really worked, but that was your idea of those drum kits that were really cheap and stapled together, you know, that was that was the reason behind those. That was that was your biggest seller though, the um SDS eight, I think. That was the budget kit and I think that sold it was something like eight thousand to ten thousand units or something. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But it was a cheap as you saw by the pad, it is, it is a very cheap pad. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I had a quick question for uh, uh for Pat and um and Steve was just about the early days. As far as Dave Simmons' day-to-day -day involvement, I mean, w was he over your shoulder constantly, or did, sh did he just have the the vision and the design in place and set you all to task? How did that? Uh, what was your experience there? He was always kept busy doing his own thing. He, he never really, he never, he never ever looked over my shoulder. He, you know, he, he would work on a bench just down the road from mine. As well, you know, Steve, he was part of the team. He was there. Definitely a worker. He was a hard worker. Yeah. Well, and and just just for the audience, I mean, you know, Dave Simmons is still very much alive, and I'm I'm guessing enjoying retirement in the countryside. Yeah, real hard man to get hold of. I've I've, mm. I've been trying to get hold of him for about ten years now, I think, and 
never succeeded. Last I heard about Dave, he was breeding horses somewhere. I don't know how true that is. Well, you know, he made his, he made his mark. You know, he made his mark. His drums and influence yeah. still continue to make their mark. So, you know, yeah. if uh, uh, if he does hear this podcast, you know, thank you, Dave Simmons, for you know everything you've done and you know the inspiration yeah. your instruments bring to us. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, very cool. It's it's a giant. Uh, I love to see them, and it's it, it's kind of it reminds me of uh, in a in a in a different way, like when you see someone playing like a North drum, you're like. Look, there's a North drum. <laughs> Same, similar That's with uh, with uh, Simmons, where it's like, hey, there's a Simmons. It's got that shape. It's iconic. You can see it from you know a yeah. hundred feet away and go. That's I can tell what that is. That that was a very smart move. Where you, uh, it, it played to this day. It's iconic. You know, you can still tell what it well, is. I was, I, you, I was thinking almost. You know, so, Dave's. Oh, sorry, Darren. Sorry, yeah. sorry, real quick. I was just thinking. You know, like okay, maybe it was hexagonal because you know making circles was too difficult. I was going to say the same thing. Dave's okay, standard wait, 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 did I assume correctly? Dave, Dave, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Dave's standard joke, which he, uh, when he appeared on uh, the BBC, can't think what the program was called, Micro something. And he Micro had Bill, Live. Yeah, right. And he had um, Bill Bruford with him. And they asked him the same question. And he said, because we couldn't afford a circular saw. <laughs> Oh great! <laughs> yeah, okay. Exactly. See, okay, out. and I knew just in my heart, I knew that there was some truth to that. Just you know, like I, I build drums, and you know, I'm pretty handy too. But like making a perfect circle and and yeah. you know doing that perfectly every time, yeah, it's easier just to you know just to cut straight lines and angles. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I, I really wanted to touch on, just as far as you know, this the iconic Simmons look, the shape, and everything. When you see that on stage, you kind of know what you're in store for. Um, I I really can't think of any other electronic drum that has a, a sonic identity to it. I mean, you see drummers all the time with a you know Roland pad or a Yamaha pad, you know, a little rubber pad somewhere on their acoustic kit, and I mean it could be anything. There's no identity to it. It could be you know, uh, you know, chicken noises or something. You know, there there's nothing you know really could be anything but you see the simmons up there and you kind of know what you're in store for you automatically expect to hear that do 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 that simmons sound so i i don't know okay is, is there is there any other instrument like electronic drum instrument that has an identity no. like that the, the keytar syndrome no, kidding. <laughs> the <keytar. laughs> yeah the sin the syndrome is one as well but i mean uh, all i think of uh, with the syndrome is just that you know <laughs> That, yeah. that long diving that's exactly the it. cars yeah, yeah there one. you go yeah that one they sold thousands and again there is literally one sound and i think that was the issue but you'll see that sound if you listen to a flock of seagulls a single space age love song he is one of these and at the beginning of the song goes, doo -doo -doo -doo. yeah and he used these for several years as well as simmons so he once they got a bit of money once they had a first hit single the next thing you know, oh, he's got a brand new Simmons kit, a nice white kit, Fancy. Uh, SDS five kit. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting thing I think about the uh, about the image, and you know, um, um, but you were saying earlier about you know when when we got into the decline and we kind of moved past that whole electronic era, because Van Halen were were, were big users, and uh, I saw them at. Um, uh, Monsters of Rock, which is a festival at the, the Castle Donington racetrack here in the UK, and when they were um, when they were performing, they uh, the, the the crew were just running a, a camera across that was for the headline act uh, later in the night, and the, the camera was pointing literally straight down at the stage and just just kind of craned across, and I realised that. Um, because I just assumed that Alex was playing an acoustic kit, but what he'd actually done was mounted shells around the Simmons kit, and when you saw the kit from above, uh, from this camera, he was actually playing Simmons, yeah. but uh, the, obviously didn't suit the image uh, at that point in time. So yeah, mm. I, I'd seen it with the with the Simmons bass drums tucked in a bass drum shell mm. to get that look, but I I haven't seen that. I have to check that out with the Simmons tucked inside regular Tom shells. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's kind of the catch 22 of it all is like, they're so iconic mm -hmm. that you can't escape it in a way. Once, once the next generation comes along, you're not, 
you're sort of stuck with that in a way of, uh, well, they're so iconic for that era. We want to move forward. And it sort of, you know, what do you do? You, you, you hide them in shells, I guess, and pretend you're not playing, them, well, I, which is I, I love interesting. That, I love that there's so many options out there that are electronic drums that look exactly like acoustic drums. I mean, you have your Roland VADs, yeah. you have your F notes. I mean, if you saw that on stage, you would have no idea that's an electronic kit. But, you know, you yeah. see the Simmons up there, that's, you know, unapologetically like here is an electric drum and it's, you know, it sounds like this and it looks cool. It's right in your face. Yeah. Here's a, um, a question for the colors. Um, they had so many colors, but one thing I did pick up with my research, and again, Pat or Steve might know this, was a lot of the big names use black Simmons kits, uh, pads, because they were endorsed by an acoustic company, for example. So if you, if you look at Phil Collins, oh, he's got a black kit behind him because when they're on stage, all you can see is him. <laughs> hitting these things you can't see what they are because they're black shells and again you guys can come in on that but all these colors that were available initially there were so many colors and i think then you dropped to about five but as i'm looking at all the research of all the people who played them i'm like ah, oh, so many of these guys use black kits and then i worked it out and i was like oh i know why they're using the black pad because they're endorsed by premier or pearl or who tama whoever mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. on that, was was Simmons big into endorsing people? I mean, I think Bill Bruford, like I said, Neil Peart, no. were they not going in the endorser game at all? No. Hmm. No, Virg no, virtually no, they, as um, far as I know. That's the uh, the quotes I've seen. I think Buzz Watts, um, he wrote a pretty good letter in, um, I, can't remember, I think it was some modern drummer or something, criticizing, there was some comment that they'd made in a letter. Oh, they, I think they did a retro thing on Simmons in like the 80s or early 90s. And Buzz Watts himself actually wrote in and said, we never endorsed anybody. He said, we gave up kits as a beta, like testing. And again, Bill Bruford, you can have the kits, um, but you've got to use them. And we use you for testing and, and various things like that. So that's what he did. They were basically loan these kits. And if they had someone who just wasn't really using them, they just take the kits back apparently, according to Dave and according to Buzz. I never would have guessed that Bill Bruford was a beta tester <laughs> as opposed to an endorsee because he's the face of the brand i mean really like uh, to a lot of people they'd see him like i've seen that video of uh you said what it was called before uh, micro live correct uh it's like that's just like that's the introduction to the brand so you'd think they'd be like you know give him the endorsee thing but whatever works whatever works for the for simmons right and of course fa famously on that uh, on that same program uh, Dave introduced the SDS six as being able to play the drums considerably better than Bill can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. think um, Howard Jones was too impressed with the SDS six um, because he did a live show, and again, this is when Steve probably had just met him. He he got an SDS six, which had an amazing a matrix system, which no other drum machine at the time had. Funnily enough, Roland picked up on the matrix where you can all see all the notes started using them for some of their later drum machines. Hmm. So Howard Jones had this STS-6. He appeared on some program. It was a I think it was a London TV show, only shown in the London area. And it was a live performance. And within 20 seconds, the STS-6 went off. It just died. So he's <laughs> Howard like, starts playing, and he's got about four keyboards. He's got a couple of Moog Prodigies, and I think a Juno 60 or something. And he starts playing, and he goes... Doo -doo. And he's just like, and, then he, and, and Howard just goes, it's blown up. <laughs> so, oh, man. So his, so his manager, his road manager, does the old, oh, I'm not a technician. Let's just hit the master power button, <laughs> flicks the power button off and on. SCS6 comes back on, powers up. Doo -doo -doo, everything's restored. The programs are saved. And again, the, that's, this is a live program. The TV host is just sitting there going, all right, is he going to come back? What are we going to do? So they're talking for about a minute, and then Howard's like, ready? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Try again. <laughs> Press Turn the play button. On. I've got to say, yeah. though, I mean, that kind of thing was still happening to him. Howard, I'm talking about. You, you know, sort of 20, 30 years later, when, it, you know, when, he's, you know, when he's using, like, Mac technology on stage and, you know, things at the last minute would just, just all descend into to complete chaos. And there was one time, I mean, I haven't spoken to him for ages but there was one time i texted him or something and then he he asked me a question about the roland uh the roland phantom 
was it a was it a G eight something like that? Is the 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 eighty eight note big phantom keyboard? And this was about an hour before he was going on stage in in some major venue. And I said, oh, you know, we'll, I'll come back to you tomorrow. He said, oh, no, it's right. I'm I'm just upgrading the firmware now. <laughs> <laughs> an hour before, wow. Quick question for Ed and Darren, you know, whoever wants to take it or both you guys can. Like, nowadays, it was probably different back then. Well, of course it was, because you don't, it was, you know, it's hindsight kind of thing now. What is the holy grail right now of like, you know, that you want to come across if you're in a pawn shop or something and they don't know what they have or you're at a garage sale, like I said, which I know doesn't happen very often, but like in a box that you just pull out of someone's attic, what is the holy grail of like Simmons drums that everyone is uh, hunting? Darren, you can take that. Uh, Sure, go ahead. There's rare stuff and then there's, yeah, there you go. There's rare stuff and then there's stuff that's so rare that no one even knows it existed in the first place. So just off the top of my head, like, okay, so I have a, uh, a Simmons SDS 64. Everyone remember what that was? The SDS 64 yeah, was, uh, it was software that came on a cassette tape. Hold on. Came on a cassette tape like so. <laughs> and it was drum sequencer software for the Commodore 64 computer. And it had a breakout cable come out of the Commodore and, and the inputs into your module. And it, it was a sequencer for the SDS uh, 8 and 9. Uh, and the other ones were work on it, the 200, the 400, and, you know, and so on. Um, I had never even knew it existed until I, you know, found one at a garage sale. <laughs> and, it, it, you know, it's so incredibly rare that it just, you know, no one even knows it existed. But as far as the stuff that, you know, people know, I guess. You mentioned the SDS-6, and that was a giant, it's an appliance, you know? <laughs> Weighs about 300 pounds. Uh, it's got a huge matrix, graphic matrix um, uh, sequencer on it. And um, you can uh, do a Google image search, you can find them for sale, like what, once every 10 years or so, and it's probably busted. Ed, you have one of mine that's been, I, I, I rescued that one from a garage, and, and it's probably been, sitting there you know from like the group center days in california so that's you know what 30 years and everything's corroded and wow. blown up inside and everything so as far as like the super rare stuff i would say like the sds6 and you know even the sdx um to find you know to find one of those a complete kit with symbols you know and uh you know memory and discs and all that kind of stuff uh yeah that stuff just doesn't come up and 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 mm. uh, and uh, Steve, you had the uh, the symbol as well. Yeah, describe <laughs> Steve. You held got, something up there. Yeah. Describe it for the, the non-visual <laughs> listeners. This is probably one for Ed. I think I might have to send this to you. So that's um, the symbol. I don't know how many of these are made, but it was probably one of the the worst inventions that they came up with. <laughs> um, that's for the STS five, and it's quite simple. I mean, you can see here the piezo transducer. Um, just like they use for all the pads, and there's two of them. There's one for the bell sound and one for the cymbal sound. But, um, mm. Yeah, this one needs a bit of work. It's the polycarbonate. It's the same shell material, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And they, and unfortunately, they um, they basically snap and just shatter. And I think Sibi Siebert, he was the German um, demonstrator. He he just broke them all the time at trade shows. <laughs> so they would sort of quietly take them away, I think, and eventually they would decide for the SDS seven again. They did they did come up with some. I think um, Group Center in America came up with a a better design, and they did have a few, but they they didn't mm. actually put in production. Um, but I've got a couple of pictures from Group Center that people have sent me. Who I think Lloyd Taylor, who basically replaced Steve when Steve left. Um, he sent me uh, pictures of their workshop, and at the top there were a couple of these symbols which were shattered, mm. <laughs> and they had like names scored on them. So there's obviously a story behind those symbols. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, mm. yeah, they never really caught on. I mean, there are yeah. symbols. There are symbols out there, I guess now. Um, so I'm assuming that again, Simmons were the first to come up with these um, electronic ones. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That, that that kept that visual identity, had the shape, and just looked really, really cool. That, there's a lot of stuff that I've never seen in real life, <laughs> just in pictures. And I want to recommend uh, Steve's book to everybody. This is the uh, the complete Simmons drum guide. And I'm, you know, I'm 
I'm into this book, you know, like every every other day or so. <laughs> you can find it on Amazon wow. and check it out. But just a wealth of information there and uh, complete with, uh, you know, pictures and, you know, uh, Steve Watts and Pat, you guys are in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. You're published. Yeah, y'all, y'all are in some of the pictures, you know, building stuff. So yeah, it's just it's a wonderful resource. So if you if you want to, you know, take a real deep dive into the rich Simmons history, definitely pick up that book. You'll you know, it's a page turner for sure. Nice, Ed. As we kind of get close here, same question to you. What are you looking for? Like, if, if you're, I mean, you are deep into this stuff. You're only working on the best of the best. What's something that you're like? Oh, I hope I find that in, you know, in, in some box of old stuff in someone's attic. Well, yeah, the, the, the usual stuff. SDS 5s doesn't matter how they're configured. Ideally, if they have hi-hat and cymbal modules, uh, SDS 5 cymbal pads, uh, any of the sunburst or any of the fade pads, which, you know, tequila sunrise and midnight blue, um, and then some of the more stuff like the black to white fades. Uh, um SDS-6, you always want to run into one of those uh, just because it's the coolest way to sequence drums, period. Um, SDX, just because it's, you know, it's a monster of a machine. It's still one of the best sounding samplers ever made. Um, and I think uh, Silicon Mallet, that's a, Silicon Mallet's another uh, fun one that they only made a couple hundred of that you're not going to see very often. But if you do find one, well, of course, it's not going to work. But if it did, um, when you got all the pedals and stuff hooked up, it's one of the <laughs> funnest things you could ever play. Good answer. Um, all right, guys. So there's so many people here. I thought this might be fun to see what you guys say. So as we wrap up, I want you guys to maybe describe Simmons drums, whatever as broad as that is, in one or two words and just see what each of you say. Pat, let's start with you. How would you describe Simmons drums in one or two words? Um, you know, hexagonal. That'd be it. I'll, uh, yeah, I wouldn't know how else, That's to, a great how else to describe them. You know, hexagonal drums. No, Everyone perfect will answer. Know exactly what you mean. If you was to say that. Yep. Okay, I'm going on my. I'm going in my screen in order here. Ed, one or two words. How do you describe Simmons drums? Iconic. Good. All right, Darren. I got you next. What do you think? Um. That sound that you were shaking your ass to in the 80s and 90s and even today, that's that drum sound. <laughs> Very good. We'll take that drum sound to be less words. Sure. <laughs> uh, Steve Watts, what do you think? One or two words or a couple words about to sum up Simmons drums. Well, I was going to say iconic. I'll say, I'll say Knight Rider. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That sums it up pretty well, too. Yep. All right, Steve Graham, you've, you're very close to this brand through writing your book. What, how do you sum up your entire book in about two words? <laughs> um, it just, um, it's a story. It's the best of British, I think. And um, for me, to have a British company that's so successful, um, the more I wrote it, though, the more... And again, the book is not complete. I think, um, what's the early one? Bob Henry's book, The Complete Simmons Drum Book. Well, no, it's not complete. <laughs> Uh, my book's the same. It, my book is not complete because there are still so many stories. The book would be just thick. Sure. All the all the stories behind, and again, even now, some more have come out. You know, it's it's, and again, the, for me, it was the people, the people I got in contact with, like Steve, um, Lloyd Taylor, who replaced Steve, uh, David Halford, um, who you guys will know as well. I didn't get all the people from the company, but especially with Steve, um, Steve's photographs. Was, um, which again are all actually in the book I think it just shows how the company was run all the people who made these things so again if you pick up one of these kits yeah. at a junk store you know here's the history behind it here's the book that lady there soldered this module for you or you know it's an amazing um, for me it's, it's it was never about making any money because I haven't <laughs> <laughs> I've heard um, that with writing books drum history books don't know, make uh, money yeah you don't make money and um it was never a financial venture um it was purely for the history of it again thanks to wolfgang for the the site because he's kept people interested for what 15 years i just made a wrote a book that you know some people if you can't get the internet at least you could read the book when you're in a power cut or something <laughs> but um <laughs> it's, sure. it's a pleasure to write it from from my perspective um it's the most enjoyment i've had writing any book 
That's awesome. Well, can I can I change my two words? Please, you can. <laughs> sure. Okay, I want to change it to the dum dums. Now, <laughs> explain that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Now, Pat is probably like the the most likely person to get that. The, the, the there's a very long running um, soap opera in the UK called EastEnders, and <sighs> and and for decades, <laughs> and for decades. Every episode lands up on a real cliffhanger, and just after you get that cliffhanger moment, it goes into the theme music, and it's a drum fill on a Simmons kit, and it's known over here as the Dum Dums. So <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's it. Very good answer. You went from Night Rider to the Dum Dums. Yeah. Both both iconic. <laughs> Very iconic. Good answers, guys. Um, well, this has been a real pleasure. Uh, why don't we just kind of real quickly, if, if is anyone if anyone wants to plug anything, Steve, I think we know we can get your book. I will put the links to everything, um, but maybe start with Darren. You want to tell people your website, where they can find you, social media, and then we'll just go in order, whoever wants to go next, and tell people where they can find you. I will include it in the description for easy, you know, ease of finding it, but uh, Darren, kick it off. Sure, sure. I'm mostly on Instagram and Facebook, just Darren Pfeiffer, D-A-R-E-N-P-F-E-I-F-E-R. There is another Darren Pfeiffer, and we're friends. He's a drummer from Goldfinger, so there are two drummer Darren Pfeiffers. I'm the the other one, I guess, or he's the other one. <laughs> Whatever. You can find me uh, on uh, Facebook and Instagram. I do post, you know, pictures of my Simmons gear and, you know, stuff that's working great and stuff that's broken, and, you know, so I do, you know, I do, uh, you know, tell little stories from, from time to time. Um, uh, cool. As far as my website, it's darrenpfeiffer.com. I also have uh, that drumlifepodcast.com. I haven't been, you know, back at that uh, in a minute, but you know, it's definitely something I want to get back to. Uh, but yeah, find me on social For media. Sure. Any Simmons questions uh, you have, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer if I can. If not, I know you find gents, and so I can, you know, send that question uh, you know, to the right person. So that's where to find me. Yes, uh, Steve Watts. Any anywhere you want people to find you on social media or anything like that. Um, I'm not actually on social media. Um, That's okay. But uh, yeah, company website, bigdstudios.co.uk. Um, can't imagine why you want to look me up, but if you did, that'd be great. Because they like you yeah. and they want to hear more about the dumb dumb yeah. uh, yeah. drums. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pat, anywhere you want people to di direct people or just uh, um, anything like that? No, not really. I'm, you know, to be fair, I'm, uh, I'm not a big fan of drums. <clears throat> you know, I, I was. Uh, <laughs> You know, it was enjoyable working for Simmons Electronics, but to be totally honest, I forgot all about the company, and I was reminded of it when I joined Facebook, and I found a group, past and present, Simmons Drums, past and present users, I joined that, I introduced myself to the group, told them that I once worked there, then I was contacted by Steve, and uh, that's how it all came about, but I totally forgot about them. But it was enjoyable working with them. I haven't got anything bad to say about them. But, uh, yeah, I'm happy that's, to be tired. Yeah, that's good. That's a good plug for the Facebook group. Ed, how about you? I'm sure you want to plug your, your business for your upper-tier Simmons repairs and things yeah, like that. Yeah, no, thesimmonsguy.com, uh, the Simmons Guy on Instagram, Facebook, all your social media. That's pretty easy to find me. Cool. Perfect. Steve Graham? Yeah, really, just on the Facebook site because um, there are so many members on there. Again, there's ex-company people, uh, people from the um, Simmons Group Center over in America as well, and they all uh, chip in now and again uh, when they're reminded of certain stories from those days. That's great. I'll link to that in the description and Steve's uh, book, The Complete Simmons Drum Guide, or I guess The Incomplete Simmons Drum Guide, as we now know. Um, so... Real quick, though, a big thank you to Darren Pfeiffer for uh, helping to put this all together. He's kind of directed this whole thing and put everyone everyone together. And I've always enjoyed seeing Darren at drum shows, uh, even before we really knew each other. I just we kind of I kind of stopped off and remember talking to you and just kind of thinking like it was an immediate sort of like, I feel like I know this guy. And, and now we do know each other. And it's it's great. So, uh, again, thank you very much to Darren. I think everyone appreciates wrangling all, uh, you know, six people here. So thank you, Darren. Yeah, my pleasure. This was, this was purely for selfish means. I just wanted to, you know, get you all on a video so, you know, I could learn more. Yeah. And obviously there's more to learn. So head to the Facebook group, learn more that way, get your hands on stuff, look on all the different sites and things like that. So, um, 
Guys, I think that wraps it up. I think this has been incredible. I want to thank everyone for being here and spending, you know, an hour and a half with me on uh we're all I mean we're around the world. We got New Zealand, the UK, Kansas, I'm in Cincinnati, Southern California. Uh very cool to be connecting with you guys. So um I appreciate everyone sharing your time and joining me today. Thanks, Bart. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for keeping the memory going. Yeah. Thank you very much.